So uh, are there questions to this point? Or shall I just keep plodding? Yes. Uh, I mean, do you have to name my men for the rest of the journey? Well, I think the implication is yes. Uh, in other words, had we remained monkeys, we never would have gotten into this crazy situation. We became human by forming a relationship, a symbiotic relationship with a psychoactive plant, and then we became semi-human when we abandoned it. And that's what we are now, semi-human. You know, we're capable of enormous acts of kindness and appalling acts of brutality. Uh, I think conscious self-reflection can help here. I mean, if you know this story, and believe it, and if evidence, God knows what evidence would look like, but if evidence could be found to support it, then it makes it easier to understand our dilemma. I mean, men don't want to dominate, and it's not a man-woman issue either. Uh, personality, the, the ego is a sort of genderless way of attacking this thing. The ego was suppressed by psilocybin. And in the absence of psilocybin, men and women became much more egocentric. And that egocentricity created all kinds of institutions which are very uh, unflattering to us. So uh, we, we need, I think, to if, if this idea were accepted, that this is what happened, this is why we're conscious, this is why we're so uncomfortable with consciousness, and this is where we are, and somehow this dialogue could go on outside the distorting effects of Christianity, male anxiety, and so forth and so on, then I think the conclusion would be we need some very radical social reform, uh, not simply, obviously, the legalization of spiritual transformation through substances, uh, but all of our have been built up on the assumption of ego and, and dominance hierarchy. And deconstructing that is really what the future is all about, I think. And it's a, it's a challenge. Does that go to it sufficiently? Don't be shy. It does, except for I feel like, um, well, I also feel like just in general, in the, the theory of the evolution of consciousness, the female is, is left out. I mean, here we have a theory of erection and arousal um, and male dominant uh, sort of tendency. Um, I guess it's just that, that if a matrifocal um, culture can exist only under chemicals, what, what is the implication of that? I mean, yes, transformation is necessary. Well, I don't call it matrifocal. I call it to partnership. Um, I don't think there's a pendulum swing between patriarchy and matriarchy. I think there is partnership, which is appropriate role expression. Everybody does what is appropriate to their position. And then there is the assigned role of the, of the, of the hierarchical situation. I think it was in science last week. Here is the frontier that is breaking right now, which is, uh, it's just being realized that men and women are incredibly different uh, anatomically and at the microanatomical level. I, I think there was a list of 40 physical differences in the, between the brains of men and women. And in a sense, uh, and I'm this is pure speculation, but I believe that especially in the archaic situation, well, we don't even have to talk about the archaic situation. In 1800, the average American woman gave birth 13 times. The average American woman in 1800. So you put a, a statistic like that against the phenomenon of menstruation, and what you have then when you look at women is a life absolutely rooted in the rhythms and the fact of nature. Men are sort of, it's more like a closed system. It's sealed off, uh, and there isn't this connection into the biological world. 
So men are potentially more capable of getting off the track, if you want to put it that way, meaning leaving this Gaian creode of symbiotic self-reinforcement. It's very obvious in the years I've been doing this, this looks to me like a fairly balanced group, but my groups tend to be heavily male. And women, in my own experience, tend to be far more casual psychedelic users than men. If you just look at cannabis use, usually women are very casual. A, a, a woman who is truly a smoker is a rare, rare thing. <laughs> Well, that would go along with menstruation and birth and not breastfeeding. Uh, there is, women are involved in biology in a way that men need not be. They can choose, you know, and that's why abstraction is the great realm of male activity and, and so forth. I guess I want to pick up your example of women in the 1800s giving birth so many times and point out that that also was an aberration that came from what I consider to be the learned behavior of males into domination. That when women were in control of their own reproductive cycle, there was not that many births. They were appropriately placed because the sexual activity was not dominant. And the women determined when sexual activity would take place based on what was best for the community and the offspring. No, and you're so, right. I probably yield on that. I guess then, but I try to save the point by saying this. Uh, you're right. Probably in this archaic situation, women had knowledge of plant contraceptives and they were well in control of... of they were not forced into sexual activity, which was an important piece of the domination cycle that women control the reproductive cycle and the sexual cycle, and so children were safe. It was when the concept of domination began that they lost power over when they could, when they would have sex, and then also how often they would have babies. And that was a real turning point in, in that reproductive aspect. But don't you imagine that in a world without anesthetic, even if you gave birth only three or four times in your life, these would be immense boundary-dissolving psychedelic extravaganzas. Uh, I don't have any problem with the conclusion. It's just sort of the pathway there and what the constructs were before that. No, well, I think you're right. That such a large number of pregnancies and births indicates a pattern of subjugation. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to add something about gender. I think we need to be really aware of how biochemically mediated it is. Um, I have a friend who went to a, a hormonal change that came a woman over a five month period, hormonally, and you can feel his aggression drop away in the general body. And then five months later, he changed his mind and came back. He hates being generous and loving. <laughs> and you can feel the aggression coming back, and now he's in a really, it's actually quite beautiful and not in his state. Well, now I've seen it from both ends of the back. I really understand how we can feel and how we're thinking to totally understand Oh, I know what I wanted to say about this. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but you should be aware of this. And it's interesting. It's always fun to talk about sexuality and so forth and so on. But you're, you're probably aware of these things called bonubos, these so-called uh, uh, pygmy chimpanzees. They're actually not noticeably smaller than ordinary chimpanzees, but they are a distinct species. First of all, we differ from chimpanzees by 2% of our genome. 98% of us is chimpanzee. We differ from the bonubos in about the same amount. Chimpanzees are uh, uh, male dominant, highly monogamous, very territorial, so forth and so on. The bonubos, which are to a non-zoologist indistinguishable from the chimpanzees, all aggression is mediated through sex. Incredible, I don't even, I'm surprised such animals can exist because I would have thought a virus would have jumped into this situation. 
But the bonobos are incredibly highly sexed animals. All forms of sexual activity are going on almost constantly. And all aggression and all social distance and everything is uh, ameliorated by sexual activity, usually initiated by the female. Well, if you look at these two animals, chimpanzee and bonobo, they, you can't tell them apart. I think what it means is that this matter of our sexual expression and dominance and so forth and so on is riding on a cusp of some sort. We can go either way. That's why we're the only animal species where there is no defined style of pairing. In other words, we have monogamy in some societies, polygamy, polyandry, a whole smorgasbord of social and sexual arrangements that we will tolerate. No other creature is like that. And I think it indicates that we are in a zone of ambiguity on this matter. And means that means we have a lot of leeway. We can send ourselves one way or the other. You know, we can build a nightmarish, male-dominated, uh, crypto-fascist kind of situation. Or we can go the other way. Bonubo or chimpanzee, we're looking down both those roads. Are you saying that basically we have not been able to go the or the... Well, we've been destabilized. I think we were stabilized in the chimpanzee dominated mode, and then a hundred thousand years of psilocybin use put us closer to the bonobos. Now, the bonobos are almost extinct. There's only a few thousand of them left. They need to be studied. There was a paper recently, uh, I can't give you the citation, but if you write me, I can't. Uh, uh, studying uh, chimpanzees in Africa, they would only leave the nest, they would only leave the trees and descend down onto the ground to forage, but the only thing they would do this for were mushrooms. Well, curiously enough, the uh, pygmy chimps are really the only animal where any success has been gleaned in um, the sign language communication and the more modern versions of that. But the, uh, the pygmy chimps are the ones which can use the message boards actually for some effectiveness. The only ones that kind of have language ability, you know, the hopes for dolphins, whales, and regular chimps, it's just still a blank. But the pygmy chimps, they're doing it. So here we have the language thing come on the cusp for them. So it would be very interesting to know if psilocybin, I mean, they might be an image of us half a million years ago. You know, I mean, in other words, were we to go extinct and the bonobos to flourish, there might be another anthropoid species take the stage in a million or two years. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is sort of a question to mainline the um, psilocybin. In my experience, uh, I've seen many men, especially a lot of veterans in the psychedelic movement, take high doses and don't care one who about gender issues or justice or equality. Um, so I'm not sure that that has any, I think the psychedelic experience can reinforce all your prejudices, but psilocybin itself can't necessarily open you up, melt down you, um, have to seek out justice. Well, I guess I'm more of a believer than you are. I just say they didn't take enough. And, <laughs> and the other thing is, you mentioned these were heavy hitters in the male heavy hitters in the psychedelic movement. It may just be that some people can't be saved. That that Christ Himself couldn't uh, lift some people out of chaos. Uh, I, I haven't had that experience. I mean, I I think that. Well, it's easy to ask the women in the psychedelic movement about their. Because, I mean, you come from a certain perspective of male dominators. Uh-huh. And you check it out. What specifically should I ask them about their experience? If they feel that um, the men in their lives change to um, strictly high doses of psilocybin or other psychedelic use, that there's more justice. I mean, my thing is that the family is the most interesting social stage. There is. is there justice in the family? Is there a partnership model happening in the family? Is the father actively taking care of the children in the family? 
Well, that's a sort of a different question. I liked your first question better. Do they see in the men in their lives the tendency toward the softening or justice? The, but the state of that is really related to each other, you know, the family. Yeah, the problem I have with that is I think the modern family is, first of all, a very modern invention and basically a cauldron for the production of neuroses. <laughs> well, let's ask these women, how about this proposition that psychedelics make men smoother, evener, more? Does anybody want to denounce that? Yeah. Well, my experience, and I don't use the word raise, that's all I that's the culture that I've been involved with for the last few years, with combined, the psychedelic experience combined with, um, the information as we're speaking, the um, reinforcement of the issues, the um, teaching of of the balance, that it has been a, not on that scale, and I, I read the book last night, that I read the Bible, um, with the Sinti Larry factor of saving all the children, you know, reach everybody, and as opposed to that, maybe reaching the, the people that want to be reached, they the be the creators, the artists, the philosophers of this time. I have seen that. Um, experience and, and very positive effects. But there's my life that we've seen in There has to be, I think it has to be that, that's the place for it. <coughs> teaching. You have to, and not some sort of like dominating teaching on either side of the male or female, but some people who now comprehend the kind of oneness, basically. Um, you mean there has to be a supportive yeah. option? Yeah, there has to be a place for it. Yeah, yeah. and part of what complicates it is notice that the male dominated society we're living in is just fanatically concerned to suppress this. And to me, that's a sign that it must threaten it at a very basic level. And yet it seems silly. I mean, they're more concerned about suppressing psilocybin than, you know, all kinds of obviously greater social ills. Why? Well, it's because it disrupts their model of how things should be run. Over here? Yeah. I'm just going to say, I hope that we can assume that there are some men out there who aren't dominators and uh, trying to sort of grind everybody else down, particularly with uh, women. There are men out there who have worked out relationships with women and with other men that are cooperative partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, well, and a lot of them never took suicide. Well, you, you live in a society, you, you take upon yourself the tone of the time. I mean, a lot of people wear tie-dye who never took LSD. Uh, it, you sort of take upon yourself the ambiance of your time. I don't really like the getting it into a gender thing. I really think ego, here's the way I put it, ego is like a, a cyst which will begin to grow in you whether you are male or female, unless you take a psychedelic. The psychedelic is that it will dissolve this cyst. The cyst is in your personality. It's a tumor. It shouldn't be there. I mean, we do need to have egos, little egos, so that when I take you out to dinner, I put the food I order in my mouth, you put the food you order in your mouth. That's what an ego is for. But if I start giving you orders, then that's completely inappropriate. So rather than genderize it, which I think is a mistake, because let's face it, after thousands of years of this maladaptive cultural style, many women are hard-driving, egomaniacal, ambitious. Uh, it's a bad style. and. You may, men may be born into it and women may be infected by it, but there's plenty of it around in men and women. Yeah. Um, I've been involved in, like, the psychedelic sort of therapy, and basically people are drawn to it if they're willing to look at their own shit, and that's what the mushroom does. Mm -hmm. And here's an oh, <laughs> And, um, <laughs> the person who's willing to do that is like the, the dissolution of the ego, and it has a reverberation for people who won't or aren't in a position to do that or they're, they're so mm -hmm. um, involved in protecting their ego that they're not in that place yet. But that both men and women benefit from that. And it goes beyond that for people who really will not use that. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we should at some point in all of this say, obviously not everyone uh, should take psychedelic plants. Well, then the question automatically follows, well, who shouldn't? Well, uh, in practical terms, we all know people who are lightly here, who have diminished self-esteem, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, they are, for them, the ego dissolution is not the goal. They have been so victimized by egomaniacs that they have no sense of self. So for them, they should be encouraged to build up an internal structure in their personality and a coherent reference point in the self. But that is a, 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 a state of dis-ease that most of us are not like that. M most of us are ordinary or more toward the spectrum of ego dominance and, and we profit from the psychedelic experience. Women, I think, are less excited by psychedelics because they experience, by and large, it has less of an impact. Uh, I mean, I've seen many, many people change their lives on a dime, like after a big LSD trip, but most of those people were men. Most of those people were, were men. Yeah. I wanted to ask, um, what you thought about traditional indigenous cultures such as the Aborigines in Australia, um, I stayed with a group for about three months now, and I found it to be a very male-dominated, aggressive culture. And yet they were using these shamanic and you know, psychedelic plants for ritual and ceremonial use. Well, I mean, here's what I think. Um, once this African paradisical partnership thing was disrupted and people were scattered to the four corners of the earth, the memory never was lost and there is even what's called a nostalgia for paradise today throughout time the belief that in the past it was better and since the renaissance it's been fashionable to dismiss this as a kind of naivete you know the grass is greener kind of thing but I think probably things were better and that our nostalgia for paradise is what has caused us to be so, such, so subject to to abuse and use of drugs. You know, no other animal shares this pattern of behavior. Uh, sometimes elephants will push down fences to get to rotting fruit and birds get drunk and fall down on their little feeders and uh, this sort of thing. But, but human beings addict to a startling spectrum, not only of substances, but of behaviors. We addict to each other. I mean, uh, heroin withdrawal and a broken heart look and feel exactly the same way. You know, abandonment, bursting into tears, insomnia, inability to eat. Uh, I mean, does this person have a broken heart or are they getting off junk? You can't tell. And I, we, we tend uh, to addict. And I think this is a kind of we feel in ourselves a certain incompleteness since the breakup of the African Partnership Society. And, you know, alcohol doesn't quite do it. Uh, cannabis is good, but doesn't quite go far enough. Uh, we've tried all kinds of things. And interestingly, in the last hundred years, the science of ethnography and anthropology has scoured the world and brought back to us data which we didn't have 100, 120 years ago. Data about peyote, ayahuasca, datura, psilocybin, uh, morning glory, so forth and so on. The materia medica of the, of the remote human cultures of the planet is, is now available. And I think uh, it comes not a moment too late. That's why I called my book The Archaic Revival. I really see the whole cultural impulse of the 20th century as an impulse toward the archaic. In other words, if you think about it, it begins with impressionism. Well, what is impressionism except LSD 30 minutes in? In other words, the sharpness goes, the colors brighten, everything begins to blur, the boundaries 
are beginning to dissolve. It's contentless. It's, I mean, it's ideologically empty. It's just how things look. They look this certain way. Well, then, uh, 20 minutes later, ideas are being, beginning to accompany this melting and flowing of perception. That's, we've now reached surrealism and Freud and Jung, the discovery of the unconscious. Well, then, it keeps going. It gets more and more intense. Now we don't see dreamscapes distorted gargoyle-like figures melting watches and burning giraffes. That has all been now replaced by just a blur, an energy storm. Now we're in a Pollock of some sort. Uh, we're down at the quantum mechanical level where energy is flinging itself around. And at the same time, things like jazz, which carried with it a heavy content of sexual looseness, the flapper era, that whole thing, people weren't Victorian ladies and gentlemen, that they had the cannibalistic drive, the Oedipal drive, the this drive. The Hitler proved that, you know, 500 years of Western ethics have you shoving people into ovens as a political uh, course of action. The whole of the 20th century has been an exploration of the archaic. And then in, in the 60s, LSD appeared, but without the rhetoric of shamanism. LSD, for those of us who lived through it, was presented as the latest thing after penicillin and birth control. It was better living through chemistry. It was now we have penicillin, and now we have orthonovum, and now we have uh, LSD. It was better living through chemistry. You've all seen the poster of the guy, kids in the hate holding the banner. Uh, in the 70s, it was realized that the psychedelic experience need not be confined to LSD, it was generally realized, and that there were all these ethnographic usages, ayahuasca, peyote, datura, morning glories, so forth and so on. And uh, then late in the 70s, the shaman became the paradigmatic figure for cultural emulation. And that, that's basically where we are now. Uh, the nation state is dissolving. It's a creation of Renaissance rationalism. Electronic media is retribalizing the world. Pharmacology is throwing open a vast cornucopia of psychoactive substances. And uh, the legacy of psychoanalysis, modern art, quantum physics, and phenomenology have propelled us to the brink of a, a neo-archaic understanding of our world. And now it has to become more explicit. I mean, I don't think there's much chance of survival without a major effort to reestablish archaic styles and institutions. And it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, if you're idealizing 70 naked people with no physical culture who are following along behind their cattle on the plains of Africa, and you want to take their social institution, psychology, philosophy, and aesthetic and lay it on to a global electronic culture of 7 billion, you're going to have to, there's going to be some creative twisting and turning in all of that. Uh, nevertheless, I believe it can be done. Now, there's one more aspect of this that I want to touch on that's sort of philosophical in general, and that is we've talked about the psychedelic experience. We've talked about how it dissolves boundaries and changes cultural values and so forth. But what we haven't talked about is what is it exactly? I mean, what's so great about it? If you read a description of a psychedelic experience, it sounds sort of like, uh, 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 well, everything dissolves, you see a lot of bright colors, you have funny ideas, and then you have to rest for a day. Well, what is so great about that? I mean, why should that be a cultural, culturally transforming issue? Well, I, I believe that that we misperceive the psychedelic substances if we simply think of them as an inert substance in a plant which when taken by a human being dissolves programming and shows you the basement of your mind essentially that isn't what's going on I believe 
Here is much closer to what's going on. Psychedelics convey information. The other kind of chemicals in nature that we're familiar with that convey information, aside from DNA, are pheromones. Pheromones are aromatic compounds released by plants and animals, usually to carry a message within the species. So ants, as you know, lay down chemical trails that other ants sense and can follow. Well, uh, in a sense, hallucinogens are, are intraspecies pheromones of some sort. They carry information across species lines. And uh, the kind of information that they carry, the message, is one of harmony, balance, and uh, integration. And so a human population with a, with a psychedelic institution or sacrament will, in its pristine form, tend to be nomadic, have very little physical, cultural expression, uh, tend to have a very loose family structure, an extended family structure and child-rearing uh, arrangement. And I believe that this is where we can introduce the concept of the Gaian mind. The reason the psychedelic experience is so paradigm shattering is because we believe that we are alone in intelligence on this planet. And what the psychedelics show is, no, there is a much larger field of mind than we ever could suspect in our ordinary state of consciousness. Nature herself is a minded entity and information is flowing between species, between biosystems, across biota, gradients of light, chemical release, water, so forth and so on. All of nature is a vast communicating mind of some sort. And the only portion of that vast system that is out of alignment is the human world because we, we closed the channel. We closed the channel by abandoning the shamanic institutions. In many, many human languages, the word shaman means go-between. Go-between. Well, go-between what and what is the question? Well, the answer is go-between the safe pedestrian assumptions of an organized society and the vast churning ocean of mystery that is real being. And every society is an illusion reared against the mystery of real being and pursued in ignorance of it. So the, psych the, the shaman mediates between these two worlds, the ordinary world people have to live in in order to catch fish and have children and form relationships and bury the dead, and another unseen, dynamic world of energy, of process, of uh, strange attractors, of the great unknown. But it isn't an abstraction. It's nature. And history is the consequence of an animal species losing its connection to the Gaian mind. And instead of then a Gaian agenda, integration, unity, cooperation, you get an ego agenda. Dominance, resource extraction, territorial acquisition, control of other human beings, and resources. So when shamanism died, when hallucinogens became stigmatized, when the climate changed, we literally fell into history. We became a different kind of animal. And the consequences of untrammeled historicity being practiced for 12,000 years is to bring us to our present situation where we have immense intellectual understanding of some aspects of nature. We have an immense ability to coordinate uh, group activity 
in certain areas, like building a bridge, but not disarming, for example. Uh, but we have no ability whatsoever to control this darker self that sort of drew itself up to the campfire 12,000 years and said, you know, you have you banished me into the darkness for a million years while you lived in a psilocybin-driven paradise. But here I am again, and the piper must be paid. Now, all the cards are on the table, and it's up to us, we who live on this planet at the end of the, of the 20th century, to try and do something with these facts. If we go extinct, if we wreck the planet and toxify the environment, it will be a tremendous tragedy because there are ways out. There are answers. But how much of the baggage we've accumulated over the past 4,000 years are we going to be able to take with us into that new world? Bloody little, I maintain, our music, our mathematics, our dance, our theater. Uh, I don't think our technologies are, are going to be able to come with us unless they go through serious downsizing and uh, detoxification. Uh, so really, the discovery in the 19th and 20th century of these ancient ways of relating to plants, it's not just a curiosity of anthropology or an exciting subfield of botany. It is, in fact, very central to the human drama of our salvation. Because I don't think we can fix ourselves through rhetoric. If we could fix ourselves through rhetoric, then Buddha and Christ would have done the job. Uh, we can only fix ourselves by consciously analyzing our dilemma and then intervening. And I believe these uh, cultures that have existed in a kind of suspended animation in the rainforests of the world while Western European civilization charged through its merry adventure, the the... Uh, raison d'etre for the existence of those aboriginal civilizations is that they carry the archaic gnosis. It's all still intact for maybe 30 or 40 more years if we act quickly. The material are, is there, the techniques are there, uh, it can be saved, but it has to be brought into modern civilization. And so, you know, classes like this uh, and I will now offer a tremendously down interpretation of the same thing. It, it, these things are all alkaloids. It may just be that in this universe, alkaloids are always bitter. So that Gaia herself, you know, it's like, can God make an object God can't lift? Uh, can Gaia make an alkaloid that isn't bitter? I don't know. It's a challenge. I mean, I know that alcohol is bad. My my question is that are the alcohol something that we really should be taking? I'm trying to figure out the role of these foods in, in our consciousness. I see, you know, I don't I don't doubt that when we were pre humanoid and we were running through the field and we saw a mushroom, we were like, okay, I can see it. It usually looks like something I can eat. It doesn't have to spine. It's not running away. And I don't doubt that it's probably completely good. Now we see fruit and it's colorful, it's sweet. And maybe we see consciousness that we have when we eat food is just a different consciousness than we would have if we eat mushrooms. But I know that you know, mushrooms take that, coyotes take that, uh, that twerk practically kills everyone that doesn't die from it. And so... That is a recommendation. <laughs> Well, I think we have tremendous, I think we have tremendous resistance. I think the, the private issue, certainly for me and for probably most of you, it's easy to take psychedelics the first time because you don't know what you're getting into. Ever after that, you have to really have a little chat with yourself. Uh, and the, there are barriers to overcome. Um, and in the case of, of the psilocybin mushroom, which is the ur hallucinogen, or at least I'm arguing it is here, uh, I, I, when I first encountered it, it took years for me to build up a gag reflex. 
I really liked it in nature. It didn't taste bad. I used to say it tastes like cold water. That's what it tasted like to me. Uh, now I do have a gag reflex, but I think that has to do with, you know, accumulated association to it. Yeah. Could you talk a little more about, um, you referred to, I think probably the mushroom in particular, as being the, the most, or one of the most benign substances, chemicals that you're doing the brain or the body as a whole. Um, I, it was very rewarding, but I, after waiting the first 90 pages of the invisible landscape, I think the stuff that I didn't understand. Some of that was mentioned in there, and you could maybe elaborate on a little more. Well, I, I guess it's important to talk about toxicity. This is an issue. And drugs, what you have to understand is all substances are potentially toxic. You can kill yourself with water if you will drink enough of it. Uh, in the case of drugs, it, the toxicity usually lies much closer to the effective dose than it does with water. Uh, pharmacologists have a concept called LD50, which is a horrifying idea, but you should know it. LD50 is if you have 100 rats and you give them a drug, the LD50 dose is the dose at which half the rats die. And what you want in a drug, whether it's a psychoactive drug or a cancer drug or anything, what you want is a drug where the effective dose is many, many times lower than the LD50. Now, by that standard, LSD is the safest drug there is because you can feel 50 micrograms of LSD and 200 micrograms of LSD is quite a full menu. But to, ki but to kill yourself with LSD, nobody knows how much it would take. The LD50 for LSD has never been determined. It's so high. That's good news. Now, uh, psilocybin is a mid-range in this way of classification. The effective dose of psilocybin is 15 to 30 milligrams. A fatal dose of psilocybin is around 150 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So you can figure out what that is. That's thousands of times, or several thousand times, the effective dose. Well, then something like mescaline, the LD50 is only about 40 times the effective dose. But, so and by that measurement, then, you would have to say mescaline is a rather toxic compound. And it is, in fact. Uh, you have to take 700 milligrams. This is the other, another way of talking about toxicity. How much do you have to take? Uh, if you have mescaline, you have to take 700 milligrams. That's damn near a triple zero cap filled with pure alkaloid. LSD, uh, to 100 micrograms, you can lose it on the head of a pin easily. So that's, that's another way of thinking about the uh, uh, toxicity and effectiveness. Just, and then there's one other parameter. How long does the drug last? If you, if you take a substance and 48 hours later you still have your phone turned off and you're lying around in warm baths and wishing for a massage, then you took a toxic substance. It's not supposed to do that to you. It's not supposed to leave you with back aches and insomnia and a wreck. Well, by that criteria, then, DMT must be uh, one of the safest drugs there are because it carries you to a titanically psychedelic state of mind and returns you in under 10 minutes to the baseline of consciousness. Uh, now, it takes 70 milligrams of, of DMT to do that. Uh, so then that's, you know, it takes a lot more than it does LSD. Now, interestingly, and then I'll let you go to lunch. We ran a little over, so we'll go to 1230. Here's some new data that you may not have. Uh, a new psychoactive plant has come onto the scene with a new psychoactive substance in it, previously unknown to science, in a chemical family, previously unknown to contain psychoactive compounds. 
And this new compound can justly claim, though very little is known about it at the moment, and the experience itself is absolutely white-knuckle terrifying, uh, can claim to be the safest psychedelic in the world because it only takes um, a thousand micrograms, one milligram of this substance. Now remember, it took 70 milligrams of LSD, one milli or 50 to 70, one milligram of salvinorine alpha smoke will deliver you into a freakishly alien reality for about 15 minutes, and then you will return. And we know almost nothing about this drug at this point. We don't know it's LD50, but it's the, only the second compound ever discovered that is active in, in the microgram range. It is an isoquinoline. It is in a chemical family unknown to contain psychoactive drugs. They've all been uh, alkaloids or, or, uh, or tropanes or something like that. Suddenly, late in the game, here is a plant. You can get high on the plant, although you have to work at it, and it's not dramatic. It's like the first half hour of ayahuasca or something. But if you isolate this compound and smoke it, it'll turn you every way but loose. Uh, and this is new data that has just come out. It should inspire those of you who are field botanists or ethnographers. There is a vast number of plants in the literature that are listed as suspect hallucinogens. What that means is somebody said or some Indian told some botanist, we take this and we see things at night or something. Uh, Salvia divinorum was known for 20 years, but nobody could find the compound and nobody could get off on it. Well, now people are getting off and the compound has been discovered and they're looking at near relatives of salvia divinorum, including a Ukrainian mint and some coleus species. And we're finding in, man in microgram and smaller amounts a whole family of these new psychedelic isoquinolines. And what they will mean for us, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, previously DMT held all honors for, uh, you know, weirdness, the depth of the, of the call, as Heidegger likes to say. Uh, now Salvinorin Alpha is, uh, is on stage, and there's lots of work to be done. Yeah. Or uh, when you've written about DMT, you mentioned that it's uh, very similar to the brain chemistry because it's already there. Or if uh, right. uh, we're all walking around in a serotonin hallucination and don't know it, uh, and DMT is is it, is it closeness in the chemical structure to what's already there that that you refer to it as benign or yeah. I mean, I think it's fairly logic. It seems reasonable to say that first of all, you don't want to insult the physical brain. In, in any time, anyhow, because you only have one or two. So uh, you have to keep care of your brain. Uh, the, it's very interesting that the most dramatic hallucinogen, and now I'm talking about DMT, let's leave salvinorine alpha out of this because not enough is known about it, but the most powerful hallucinogen actually occurs in human metabolism. Every single one of us, as we sit here, is elaborating DMT in tiny amounts. We're also elaborating 5-hydroxytryptamine, or serotonin, in quite extensive amounts. So I believe that ayahuasca, from this standard of judgment, is probably among the safest of the hallucinogens because it's essentially brain soup. There's nothing in it that you don't already have in your brain. It's just got more of it and in a different proportion. Oh yes, they occur in the in the pineal gland. Six adenero six adenoroglomerulotropane is actually um, five hydroxytryptamine. Six hydroxytryptamine. Uh, so a lot of these compounds are elaborated in the brain. LSD is not. Uh, salvinorin alpha is not. Ketamine is not. Mescaline, 
close, but not. I mean, there are amphetamine-like compounds in normal metabolism, but that isn't one of them, yes. This is a question that you might want to be asking before we come back. But I have a two-fold question. One is, what is your opinion as to how these different substances open up different aspects? You know, each has their own little niche. And more specifically, if you could give me any uh, point of view as to the differences of the what opens up between a mushroom experience and an ayahuasca experience? How do they differ? And do you have any point of view as to the different windows or the different dimensions that different drugs open? Sure. I mean, it seems to me, and somebody with equal experience might differ, but it seems to me that the best model is like a target or a bullseye. The, the, the various substances exhibit more and more of their unique character the more you take. In other words, if you take a low dose of something that's psychedelic, it will uh, clarify your vision, stimulate you, and then, and you can't really tell whether you've taken psilocybin, LSD, mescaline, or, or what have you. As the dose increases, the specific characteristics of these substances begin to emerge. And often, they're contraintuitive to a chemical way of thinking. For example, ayahuasca and uh, mushrooms, Psilocybin is 4-phosphoroloxy and then dimethyltryptamine. When, when you remove the phosphorus group, which happens as it crosses the blood-brain barrier, you get something very much like DMT. However, when you take psilocybin, you don't get something like a DMT trip. Uh, you, you get, uh, in the case of psilocybin, the most startling... Um, quality of it is that it speaks. It speaks in English. It, it tells you things. I mean, this sounds preposterous unless you've had the experience. It sounded preposterous to me for years. I just could not imagine what my friends meant when they said these plants talk to you until I had a conversation with it. Uh, so psilocybin speaks and it's a kind of a it's a kind of a Spockian kind of message. It's about enormous machines in orbit around alien planets. It's about galactarian destiny and the history of the local cluster over the last half billion years. And it, it's an enormous scale and it's about races, worlds, technologies, civilizations, on and on and on. Switch over to ayahuasca, which is chemically almost the same animal, and it's about the waters. It's about birth, death, femininity, uh, health and disease, uh, relationships, energy flows between people. It's very human. It's very feminine. It's very organic and uh, uh, enclosing. Well, these are quite different messages. I mean, if you had one in the absence of the other, you would have an unbalanced view, I think, of what is going on. However, then, if you take these things and push them all, do double doses or triple doses, I'm not recommending this, but I'm just saying it has been done and we have the data, what begins to happen is everything migrates toward the DMT flag. The DMT flash seems to be sort of like the center of the bullseye. Now, I haven't personally had enough guts to smoke salvinorine alpha. I've watched people do it, and if you're going to do it, I suggest you don't watch people do it. Because <laughs> I was gung-ho till then. Uh, <clears throat> but as, as, assuming it lies somewhere on this spectrum, what seems to be happening is all of these things propel you toward deeper and deeper states of boundary dissolution. At the first level, you simply dissolve the boundary between yourself and the part of yourself you don't want to look at. That's called dealing with your 
stuff. At the next level, you dissolve the boundary between yourself and other people. And this is the bonding situations and that sort of thing. At the next level, uh, boundary between yourself and uh, your memories of the past. All of your experience is returned to you. And beyond that, you dissolve then into the, what you call the collective unconscious or something like that. And then beyond that, Gaian mind, cosmic mind. I mean, I'm no fan of these hierarchies of named uh, hypostatized spiritual entities, but that's the basic idea. And finally, and astonishingly, you know, I think the elf workshop of the DMT flash lies very close to the center of, uh, of the experience, of, of what is possible. It, it is not simply, as you might have gotten the idea from reading the literature, you see, in the 60s they wanted to map it over Buddhism. Or, or Eastern religion. And they wanted to say that as the dose increases, somehow Satori or Shunyata or Nirvana or the white light or the great void or something like that. I never had that experience. Uh, as I raised the dose, the complexity of the state complexified. It never simplified. It never became Neoplatonic. It always, it just, it became Borgesian. To, you know, the universe is full of a number of things. So uh, I, I don't think we can, you know, some, this is maybe time to stop, but I'm reluctant to connect this entire enterprise to what is popularly called spiritual growth. I just think it's more like about growth. And spirit implies some weird anti-materialist bias or something like that. Uh, these, you know, I was raised Catholic, so to me, spirituality means: Do you visit the sick and imprisoned? Do you clothe the naked? Do you feed the hungry? Do you bury the dead? Do you comfort the afflicted? This is what that. When I see somebody doing those things, I say, "This is a spiritually evolving person." When I see somebody taking psilocybin. I say, there is an explorer. But I don't try to lay on some moral judgment about good and evil. I think that's, that's inappropriate. Uh, um, spiritual accomplishment is manifested by moral action. And uh, the role these psychedelics play is they may make moral action easier because they show you your memories and your debts and your mistakes. But intrinsically, they are not tools for spiritual development. They are tools for the exploration of mind. And we don't know what that is. And we probably won't figure it out this afternoon. But anyhow, we'll come back here. And since it's now 1230, let's come back at 2 o'clock.